Okay. All right, so Cutter is uh, the American Natural History Museum's Astro Visualization Guide. Is that the correct way to? Yep. Um, he's sitting in New York at 4 in the morning right now, and will now demonstrate how he visualized New Horizons encounter with Pluto last year, I think. And then after he's gone through that, and perhaps one other, uh, Alex will talk through how this works and what's happening, how much of it's happening in open source. Uh, Carla, mm -hmm. take it away. Well, great, thank you, and, and uh, hello, Singapore. Uh, I, I wish I was there. <laughs> I'm actually uh, at my mom's house on Cape Cod in Massachusetts, just south of Boston. Um, and uh, so we're going to start off here looking at the uh, um, the spacecraft. Uh, the idea with uh, this software is to uh, uh, spacecraft scale to about the size of a baby grand piano. If we come in close to the in science instruments, uh, uh, Alice and Ralph, uh, and you know the American television show, The Honeymooners, um, Alice was skinny and Ralph was was uh, a little more fat. <laughs> and so Alice is a skinny ultraviolet spectrometer and Ralph is the uh, um, infrared and, and, uh, um, and visible wavelength scanner. Um, so they, they take multiple wavelengths. Um, the, it, the images we'll, we will be seeing are um, from the LORI camera. And this is a, uh, a telescope. Um, it's sort of like a, um, oh, uh, about uh, a, uh, I think a, a 25 or, or uh, 30 centimeter uh, telescope, uh, essentially, that, that uh, takes about one third of a degree, so smaller than the full moon uh, picture. And then uh, over uh, further on the left, we have um, two particle and fields instruments uh, to measure the sort of plasma environment, both of the solar wind and uh, the, the particles uh, energetic particles um, from the Pepsi instruments. And um, if we just quickly come around back, um, thanks, Alex. We're, we're looking now at the radioisotope thermoelectric generator, and that's that's you know, somewhat in black. Um, Alex, could you circle it with your pointer? Thank you. It's, it may be a little tough to, to see, but that's plutonium. Plutonium is hot. Space is cold, so you run a thermocouple which is your battery. And this brings us around to where we can see Pluto in the distance. The line going through the spacecraft is the trajectory line. Also, the uh, views of the, the uh, cameras, we can see in the background, we see something that looks like a fly swatter, and that uh, um, is over Pluto. And uh, that's, that's the ultraviolet experiment uh, view. And then a smaller view is um, the uh, camera that, that we're concerned with. We see a target. It looks like a target. Um, Alice, could we um, focus on Pluto? Great. We're now going to move in closer to Pluto and Charon. So these are the orbits of the, the various um, uh, moons about Pluto. And if we come in close, we can see Pluto and the orbit of its large moon Charon, which is half the size of Pluto. Uh, Pluto is actually smaller than the Earth's moon and uh, we can see that Pluto has, in fact, an orbit as well around the balance point called the barycenter in between the two. We see uh, shadows uh, that we've um, visualized here in light gray extending from Pluto and Charon. So um, those shadows extend straight back from the sun. And Alex, if we could pull back just a little farther, thank you, we can see uh, the other four moons, which is Styx, Nix, Hydra, and, and Kerberos, and how Styx, Kerberos, and, and uh, uh, Hydra are on one side, and Nix is on this, this other side. So uh, uh, Nix and Hydra uh, were, were first seen um, by the Hubble Space Telescope, and, and so we knew of those additional moons, and then later Styx and Kerberos were found. They were worried that there might be ring debris, um, and so they were worried if there was a ring, uh, the spacecraft might hit some debris. So we see the trajectory actually come very close to the moon's, uh, the largest moon's orbit, Charon. And Charon's on the other side of Pluto. And so the idea was that, uh, um, uh, that, that 
Charon would have dynamically swept clean that area if there was ring debris. And so that, that's the idea of the mission, was that, that the trajectory would go uh, past the orbit of Charon with, with Charon not there, and then it would go through the shadows of Pluto and Charon, actually, when, when it flies through. So we see the trajectory line with, uh, of course, that has to do with time. And so we see nodes along the, uh, along the trajectory in yellow for every hour and in uh, every 15 minutes, a, a little gray node. And so we're, we're sort of visualizing time a little bit with that. And the background of the stars is also accurate. So as uh, Alex pulls us back here, we see the Milky Way behind. That's uh, correct uh, insofar as the trajectory with respect to Pluto. So I think what we'd like to do, let's come in uh, closer if we could, Alex. Time is uh, running, and we so we see the image of Pluto. Um, I guess we're coming up on that that uh, first shot. Alex, should, should we um, clear the texture of Pluto? Mm -hmm. So here... This is sort of our best map as we were on approach. And um, we can see, uh, we can see as time evolves here, we can see how the instrument is now coming over and we've, we've set time. So we're gonna see the, one of the first full frame images. There, there we see the image. Alex, could we move a little closer, please? So we see the image projected onto Pluto, onto the target. Um, the aim in this visualization is somewhat an engineering visualization to show how the observations are made. So what we're doing is actually projecting the image that was gathered onto Pluto and so that we can see in this full frame, um, which was really uh, the morning of uh, encounter day, um, but about, or actually, I'm sorry, the evening before encounter. So this is July 13th um, in... Uh, at about uh, the, 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 the time that we may be able to see in the upper left corner shows that it's about uh, uh, hour 20 in the evening uh, on the uh, day before closest encounter. But this is when they were close enough that the telescopic view was able to cover all of Pluto as a, a sort of full view. And so we can see the heart, and the heart is very distinct here, and Alex is outlining it. One side is a little more broken. It's kind of a broken heart. <laughs> One side that we now call Sputnik Planum, um, the names have been given by the, the uh, New Horizons team, um, and uh, so that, that we can talk about these different features. Um, but Sputnik Planum, you can already see, it looks like an impact base, and it's somewhat circular, and so it's a topographical low. We're coming in for another picture. But we may want, just in the uh, interest of time, we want to run... Uh, we'd like to run a little faster so that uh, um, we'll go into the next morning. Several pictures are going to be taken here. and um, But if we go, we're now racing forward in time. Alex is, is, uh, is moving ahead in time. Multiple pictures are being taken. There are also pictures being taken of Sharon. But um, today, we'll just really concentrate on the image sequence at Pluto. What we're doing is reading NASA's um, observational geometry system. So we see where the spacecraft is along the trajectory, where the instruments are aiming, and then the resulting image is actually projected onto Pluto. On the day of the encounter, on July 14th, we were live uh, with this actually running, being operated uh, by the developer student, Michael Marcinkowski, um, from Mission Control, and uh, we were linked up with about a dozen sites around the world, including um, including uh, Singapore Science Center there. They were watching in a passive mode, but we also had active participants on the Google Hangout, about uh, eight participants around the world. And uh, so here we see the spacecraft sliding along the trajectory, observations, uh, coming up at Nix, uh, that 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 observation that just turned on and you saw it turn off was the Ralph instrument. This is the uh, Alice instrument. Once again, it kind of looks like a fly swatter, and uh, so it's making observations. And uh, as we come in, if we focus back down on Pluto, we should begin to see that we're getting so close 
to Pluto, and Pluto's getting bigger and bigger in our field of view, that now they have to take multiple images uh, of Pluto to, to get the coverage. So in, this is eight, eight o'clock in the, this is eight o'clock UTC on, on July 14th. We're getting close to where we're going to see multiple images here. And so now as we get closer, we can see that filling, filling the camera's view, we're getting a, a larger Pluto, so we're getting more and more detail. So in this mosaic, which I believe is about a four by four mosaic, that we can see how the images improve. Now, the images that are made available for us are taken from the uh, Science Operations Center's website. And the images have a high bit range uh, natively, but they publish them in JPEG format. And um, so the images have different tonalities. And uh, in a way, we can kind of, uh, we weren't trying to smooth everything out. Um, of course, NASA has published a very nice map. But in this way, the different tonalities actually emphasize the different images. So it allows us to see a better and, and better uh, Pluto. If we come in close, Alex, we can see one rather distinct crater. It's a small crater. Well, you see many craters, but there's, there's a crater just up at the top of the view that has, uh, it's, it has a, a floor of ices that we can see. And uh, so we're seeing these, these, these ice, ices. You know, we knew even before we got to Pluto that it was covered with methane ice um, and also nitrogen ice. And um, so that the uh, that nitrogen, they believe now, is forming kind of a slush and that the covering of Sputnik Planum is... Uh, it is a uh, methane ice with the consistency that Alan Stern, um, the, uh, the principal investigator for the mission, calls almost like a consistency of toothpaste. And so um, that uh, uh, we can we see this very interesting geology. We also know that because of the sort of hydrocarbons in the mix, that over time, under the ultraviolet light of the sun, um, tholins are created. And they, they're sort of the building blocks of... Uh, uh, amino acids and and uh, and and, uh, and and life. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, set of concoctions of uh, organic chemistry, uh, but they tend to be darker. So that we see uh, this mix of dark and light features. So we, we can race ahead in time, Alex, to around uh, ten uh, ten o'clock UTC. Multiple observations uh, covering both Charon and Pluto as well as uh, some of the smaller moons occasionally, the instruments going out and looking at that. But as we come up now, we're, we're at, a, at uh, 1010 UTC. This is where we're close enough to where they took what's called the stereo mosaic. So as we're moving through, we can maybe move. Yeah, okay. Here we go. And uh, so we're seeing new images, even higher resolution. And this takes a uh, four by three image mosaic, which now has enough resolution to perform, to basically be the basis for later observations that will look at the same area, but they're gonna look a little bit later. And so as New Horizons slides past Pluto, it will get a little bit different perspective, even though the next images will be even higher resolution. So by having uh, multiple coverage from two different angles, uh, that if there were any mountains to be seen on Pluto, as we're clearly seeing here, that they can then get height information. So height maps are going to be built up. Um, it was not clear as we approached Pluto um, whether there would be any mountainous forms um, because the ices, uh, especially methane ice, is very weak. The mountains we see can only be uh, frozen, uh, water or, or ice mountains. And uh, we can already see in close um, that at the edge of Sputnik Planum, there's a jumble of mountains. And those mountains have been now measured because of this technique of, uh, of using uh, stereo to, to get the, uh, the heights of these, uh, the jumble of mountains that we see down below us there, that it looks as though those are floating icebergs of, of uh, um, in the nitrogen sea, and uh, they're about 5,000 meters tall, so five kilometers tall, 
Um, we can already see the lighting emphasizes the mountains and the craters uh, and also fractures on, on the surface. Alex's cursor right now is pointing to a, 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 a crater named for Venetia Burney, who was the young, uh, young lady, uh, 11 years old, when she named Pluto, when Pluto was discovered. And she died in 2009, and, uh, but that crater holds her name. Also, uh, Sputnik Planum in the heart is also known regionally as Tumba Regio uh, for Clyde Tumba, who had discovered uh, Pluto at the Lowell Observatory in 1930. So I think we can move ahead in time a little bit. Oh, I see Alex has lined us up, actually, very nicely, so that we're now seeing the first of the high-resolution strips. And um, a series of these that were taken rapid fashion. We see one picture after another cruising through and, and covering over that same terrain as, as we saw before. And... We can now see the multiple coverage here. And right there, Alex, if you zoom in on the Terminator there, we see in the mountains here, mountains uh, that are, are about as tall as the Rocky Mountains in Colorado. And also very up, up at the top, there's, a, a, there's kind of a strange looking mound, and that's called Wright Mons, named for the Wright brothers, um, who, who made the, 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 uh, the first powered airplane in the U.S., and that seems to be a volcano. So it's a very interesting structure. Now, if we pull back, we'll be able to see, I think, the later imaging campaigns. I'm just going to grab my, my phone to check the time, how we're, how we're doing on time. Okay. I, I, I think that... I think an interest for this is that uh, maybe we'll see the la this this last uh, image strip here. We'll go for one more, and um, I think what we'd like to do is switch gears and show you the Rosetta mission. Alex, Alex is going one second per second, so this is actual speed because at this point we're so close to Pluto that we're flying so fast that uh, this this image strip we're actually seeing in real time. And so here, here we see the spacecraft. We've enlarged the spacecraft um, by a, a bit, and that's why we see all the sort of instrument views seeming to come out from the center of the, uh, instead of out of the individual instruments, it's coming out of the sort of geometric center of the model. I think this is great. Alex, I, you know, if we want to switch gears and, and uh, take a few seconds uh, we will actually do a reload of, of open space uh, to show you the Rosetta mission. Um, and um, so in this case, um, over, the, over this last year, um, the Rosetta mission, which is an ion, uh, ion propulsion mission by the European Space Agency. Of course, New Horizons was, was NASA, but the, uh, the Rosetta mission was off to the uh, comet nucleus, comet 67P, uh, cherimov gerasimenko and uh, a comet that uh, passed perihelion, or closest to the sun, I believe on uh, August 18th of 2015, when I was in Singapore. Here we see the trajectory uh, of the spacecraft approaching. It's an ion drive, but it also has thrusters. It's a very strange approach. It's this triangular approach. And um, so the uh, location at the end of this strange triangular approach is Rosetta. And then we see its view frustum in purple looking off to the comet nucleus. And we purposely made the comets, comet nucleus a model developed by uh, the Swedish uh, amateur photogrammaticist uh, Matthias Malmer. He shared this model with us, is that we kept it gray because we're going to do this image projection technique. And so the first image is coming up, and there we have the image, and we show the full image, uh, also with its the black boundary of space. And we do that black boundary because later on the comet will be outgassing, and so we wanted to be able to see the tail beyond it. But uh, as images are taken, the uh, so here we see the object is rotating, and, uh, and then the next picture when that comes in will be flashed 
onto, uh, onto the comet nucleus. And so this image projection technique that we perfected for Pluto, okay. Um, hey, can you, can you hear us, Roland? Hopefully. Um, okay, so I'll just keep talking. So here, here we see the image both, uh, okay, great. <laughs> I was just getting a message that you can hear me. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we're going to move along. Now we want to show several pictures and so we're, we're going to move ahead in time. It's constantly taking pictures. However, when we did this visualization in the spring of last year, the only pictures that were made available were on their blog. And uh, since then, many pictures have been released. But at the time, um, the mission um, was helpful to us in uh, giving us the exact times that these images were taken. And a combination of the observational geometry system, which NASA calls SPICE, and also the Euro European Space Agency uses, allows us to know where the spacecraft is and how the object it's observing is rotating. And so that we can reconstruct with this image projection in real time, in open space, uh, this whole scenario. And so here we're now seeing the higher resolution images as we get closer projected onto the model. So we're seeing the images in three-dimensional context. And uh, we wanted to do this to show how engineering, the engineering of the mission enables the gathering of the science. All of this has to be very carefully planned. In fact, the triangular approach was done because they weren't sure of the mass of the uh, comet nucleus. And so now we see the effect of the, uh, they're in close enough to see the gravitational effect and so the, the triangle becomes an arc and then finally an orbit. And so they came in close and uh, doing the tracking of, of the spacecraft uh, by radio signals back to Earth, they could judge the mass so that they could then come in very close to, re, uh, to release Philae, the, the little lander that, uh, that, they, that they dropped off, which is coming up. And um, as we come in, we'll get better images in, in a minute here. But now we can see they're in the closest approach. This is where they dropped Philae so that it would, that it would be attracted to dropping it essentially uh, down onto the surface. And, of course, it bounced about a kilometer in height. And um, the, uh, the scale of, of this comet nucleus is about, uh, is, is about 25 kilometers, I believe. So it's... it's it's a, uh, it's a small object, but still, you know, if we were to be floating next to it, it would seem quite large. These high-resolution images, um, if we come in close, we can actually see sand dunes right there. Alex, you can point out those little parallel ridges, and these are sand dunes actually created by the outgassing on a world that does not have an atmosphere because it's too it's it's too small to have an atmosphere, but the ices in the comet, when they warm up from the sun, they blow out. And so whatever dust has settled there gets pushed around by the jets. And so that's what we're seeing here. So we're seeing this combination of the imagery when we get in close. So I think basically that allows, that's, that's a quick tour of what we're doing with open space for mission visualization in this case. Um, open space is designed really to take on um, data that uh, uh, from simulations and observations that's, uh, that's very dynamic. And in, in, in such an environment like this, we have a lot of dynamics going on. We have the rotation of the object. We have the trajectory of the spacecraft. We have where the spacecraft is looking, the resulting images. And uh, this is an open source project. Uh, we've, we've just received NASA funding over the next five years to uh, really develop this. And we're very excited about this because this allows us to bring this to the world. And because it's an open source, non-commercial project, it allows us to then put this on top of different vendor systems, including at the Science Center. And uh, so uh, I'd like to just turn this over for um, Alex to talk a little bit about the code 
And um, so anyway, uh, thank you. Yes, thank you, Carter. Uh, I'm not exactly sure who's in the audience and where, where, who I should address it to, but uh, <laughs> um, Roland, you said in the beginning about what, what part of it, or part of them are part of the software is open, space, uh, open source. And uh, so for that part, I can say everything except the spice cones, which we got with the permission of the science team, which are not yet to release, uh, everything else is on GitHub. So you can go on github.com forward slash open space and just uh, get, get hold of all of the source code. And uh, I guess that's the easiest, w the easiest way to, uh, to, yeah, to get it. And also, we hope that we can get a lot of contributions from all over the world and uh, um, perfecting the software. So, uh, well, it's always the more, the more people work on it, the better, of course. And uh, like Carter said, by putting it uh, out as open source software, um, we're making it available for many, many more uh, venues than would be possible with commercial software. So, for example, our, our goal is, for, is to uh, include it in different classrooms or smaller venues which uh, might not have the turnover of people that can afford the, um, the commercial so surface, um, uh, softwares uh, to run it on a regular basis. So, I don't know if, there, if there's the opportunity for any questions, because that's uh, what I uh, prefer. And throws us off the stage. Um, <laughs> questions? I'll have to type them, but <laughs> questions anyone? No. Can hear you. No. Pat. No questions from anyone in the room. Just this one machine. Well, I can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Well, yes. Excellent. So, not even from the machine vision people. No. Well, I can't um, see. We're in a dark room. All right. Um, I might make a comment. Roland, I think there was a question. Oh, oh, sorry. Good. Hang on. Good. We're getting a question. Mike. I was just curious, from a sort of implementation perspective for open space, what was the most challenging part? So, implementation perspective, the most challenging part? For the uh, projection or for the rendering itself? <laughs> the entire project, I think, is the question. <laughs> for the entire project, I think the biggest trouble is uh, dealing with Precision errors and floating point numbers. <laughs> if you want to represent the whole universe, uh, floating point numbers are not really cutting it. So you have to start dealing with dealing with smarter with how you deal with uh, how you set up your scene graph and how you traverse those things. Uh, we're currently still working on it. Uh, we have sort of a working work in progress solution, but uh, we have currently one master student working on uh, implementing a solution for that. So, for example, at the moment, what we can do is well, we have you can still see the screen, right? Yes. yes, yes, yes. So if we start if we start zooming out and we go way outside of the solar system, as Carter said, the stars are all in their relative correct positions. So if we start zooming out, we can see that well, we are actually in a 3D environment. And but that's about the limit of the uh, uh, floating point precision that we can currently handle. And I think from a pure technical point of view, that's the more difficult part. From What's open, space, what's open space is dynamic range? What, in terms of the sort of smallest to largest uh, dimensions that it represents? Um, at the moment, it's we have 67p. At, no, the models are actually the, the, the lowest one. Then we uh, increase them by a factor of 1,000, so it's uh, in single digit kilometer. And then out to, I'm not sure what the stars are, a couple of hundred light years, maybe? But you, you also have to scale that to the known universe, right? Yeah, that's that's the ultimate goal. Yes, but for that we need a, a smarter way to deal with the floating point errors. It's going to be bigger. And that's uh, yeah, that's going to come up very soon. I, I wanted to uh, just uh, give a shout out to um, a big part of uh, open space development. A number of students uh, have been working at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center uh, with a space weather modeling uh, facility there um, that monitors the sun to actually for the, the very important. Um, uh, prediction of where uh, coronal mass ejections, so solar flares, are headed um, toward our, our uh, billions of dollars of assets, which are out across the solar system and, and so many satellites now. And um, so, uh, in the hat, uh, looking at doing volumetric rendering interactively um, from from the sun, 
and uh, the work uh, to look at uh, you know the process, astrophysical process of, of space weather, can be applied to other astrophysical simulations. And so, um, perfecting those techniques, which are really right, really right at the edge of uh, data visualization research, with uh, uh, which Linköping University in Sweden, where Alex is getting his PhD, is uh, one of the pioneers in, in that field. And uh, that now, with the funding from Open Space, um, we're also partnered with New York University and the University of Utah in uh, the U.S. Um, with the uh, Scientific Computing and Imaging Institute. And so, at this point, this really is a, a, a international collaboration. Um, and uh, our two new students uh, from Linshipping that just arrived in New York are going to be working on globe browsing systems. Uh, similar to Google Earth, so we can zoom in on Earth, Moon, Mars, and now Mercury that we have very good maps for, and uh, um, so that we can continue uh, this visualization, adding in the scale graph technique uh, to give us uh, scaling across the universe. We're also hoping to perfect that uh, in uh, this first year of the NASA funding. Uh, uh, the funding is for the next five years. All right. Well, thank you. I, I'm actually excited about it. Some other people less so, but it's really cool. Thank you very much for joining us at this completely unsocial hour. <laughs> much, much appreciated. And uh, I look forward thank to you your next much. having an excuse to be in Singapore. Thank you very much. <laughs>